Today we're going to continue our Bible study series based on the parables of Jesus. And the title of our lesson today is The Failure of Success. Now what do you think of, what goes through your mind when you hear that title, The Failure of Success? Uh, for me, I think one of the first thoughts is how can you have failure if you're a success? But if we think about it a little bit more deeply, a little bit more closely, I think we can understand that um, in the sense that when you try really hard to be a success in one area and you put all of your energy and effort into that area, it can cause you to be a success in that area, but you might end up being a failure in another one. A good example would be if you invest all of your energy, your time, your efforts into your career. You could be very successful in that career, but if you're not careful in the process, you might end up being a failure as a spouse, as a husband or a wife, or a failure as a parent. The story we're gonna look at today that Jesus tells this parable, it's about a man who was a tremendous success in one area of his life, but he was a failure in an area that was much more important. This story is found in Luke chapter 12. The parable is often called the parable of the rich fool. And as I said, the title of our lesson is the failure of success. So let's jump into this story about this man who is a tremendous success but yet a failure at the same time. We look at Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 13, and it says, someone in the crowd, again, uh, Luke chapter 12, verse one, tells us that this is a crowd of thousands of people that Jesus is teaching and talking to. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, talking about the whole crowd now, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Uh, some translations put greed, uh, same word, same meaning there. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all of my grain and all of my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So, what is the background of this parable? What is it that Jesus is trying to communicate, and what does that mean for us today? Well, let's take a look at this story. As we said, Jesus is speaking to this big crowd, thousands of people, according to chapter 12, verse 1. He's teaching them, and uh, at some point in his teaching, I don't know if it's in the middle or during a break or at the end, this man speaks up and he says, Teacher, would you tell my brother to divide our inheritance? Um, just from that statement, we can kind of assume a couple of things. First of all, there's probably only two sons, and their parents have died. Um, and because there's no other sons mentioned. And according to Jewish law and tradition, you can read about it in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17, that in their culture, um, when the parents died and the inheritance was divided, the oldest son got twice as much as any of the other uh, sons. And so in this case, the older son, uh, also the older son is the one who is responsible to divide the inheritance. So the older son is to get two-thirds, and this one who's so impatient, who's so anxious uh, that his brother hasn't divided it yet is going to get one-third. Now, he comes to Jesus, and we might say, why did he come to Jesus? Well, Jesus was a teacher. He was a rabbi. These were men who were um, deeply studied and understanding of God's word and God's law, which applied to every area of life, not just spiritual things. And so they were the people that people, uh, they were the ones that people would go to for wisdom and advice about just about any area of life. And they also had the authority um, to 
issue uh, judgments, to, to issue decisions that people would abide by. So Jesus would be a logical choice to come to, but Jesus turns him down. Why does he turn him down? Well, Jesus has a different focus. Jesus didn't come to judge between these types of issues. He came to bring the good news of the kingdom of God. And Jesus uses this, uh, oper this, this, this situation as an opportunity to teach about something very, very important. We find that, um, we look at verse 15, he says, Take care, be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Um, when he says one's life, he's not talking about just the fact that I'm alive and I'm not dead, I'm living. He's talking about our essential life, the quality of life, that which is most important to life, that which brings happiness and well-being. And as he gets to the end of the story, he calls this rich person a fool. It's important that we understand these words before we dig into its meaning. A fool. Now, today, when we think of someone being a fool or being called a fool, we often think of someone who's not very smart, somebody who's not very intelligent. But that's not the meaning of the the um, the term fool in the Bible. In the Bible, when you called someone a fool or you referred to them as a fool or they were a fool, it was a very very strong word. It basically was talking about someone who rejected the knowledge and wisdom of God as the basis of life. In other words, they basically lived their life without taking God into account. That's why Psalm 14.1 and other places in Scripture say, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Whether they really believe that or not, the fool is the one who lives his life as if there is no God, doing his own thing, his own way, with his own preferences. So again, a fool is not someone with low intelligence, but one who dishonors and disobeys God. So as we take a look at this story, this rich man, who's already rich, has a tremendous bumper crop. His barns are already full. He says, what am I going to do with all this excess? He decides to tear down his old barns, build newer, bigger ones, and store it all up so he's got even more to live on, eat, drink, and be merry, and enjoy life. And God says, your life's over tonight. Now what's going to happen to everything that you've accumulated? Of course, the idea is, what have you done with what you have? So who does this rich man represent? I'll be honest with you, this rich man can represent anybody. I think that we can perhaps um, look at how this might apply in our lives by, by looking at some words that can describe this rich man. You know, as we've read this story, perhaps you've heard it before, what words would you use to describe this rich man? Uh, I've come up with four. The first one is I would describe him as selfish. He's selfish. Go back and reread the story, uh, the parable that Jesus told. We find that this rich man says, I, six times. He says, my, five times. It says he talks to himself. He doesn't talk to anybody else. He doesn't talk to God. And his attitude is that he's concerned about his own welfare, his own pleasure, his own security, his future, and nobody else's. There doesn't seem to be any willingness to share. When he's got this excess already, and now he's got more excess, there's no talk about, hey, can I help somebody else? Can I give to the poor? Can I meet the needs of those who are doing without? In fact, it says in the application, Jesus said that this is someone who stores up for himself stores up things for himself. So the first word I would use would be selfish. The second word I would use would be greedy. Um, in the English Standard Version from which I read, it said that Jesus said to beware of covetousness. Other translates, uh, translations translate that word greed. They mean pretty much the same thing. So I would, def I would describe this guy as greedy, greedy. We're gonna talk more about this idea of greed in just a moment. A third word I would use for this rich man is he is godless. Now, I mean godless. In other words, he's living his life without taking God into account. God is not a part of his life. And then the last word I would use is ungrateful. Ungrateful. There's absolutely no indication that he is thankful or grateful to God for the blessings of his life. 
So what's the main point of this parable? In, in every parable, there's, there's one really main point that um, Jesus is trying to get across. Now, there'll be maybe some other sub-points, and we've talked about some of those in previous lessons, and we'll do it again uh, in the future, and even some today. But what's the main point of this parable? I would say, in my words, that a life lived for yourself is foolish. A life lived for yourself is foolish. It makes me re, uh, think of uh, a saying that Jesus said. It's recorded in Mark chapter 8, verses 35 and 36, when he says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Um, uh, kind of a side issue that adds to that thought that a life lived for self is foolish is something that Jesus said here, and I would word it this way, possessions do not determine the quality of life. Now that is so contrary to a lot of the viewpoints and philosophies of this world, you know, that uh, you can have a better life if you got more, if you've got better, if you got bigger, if you've got more money, more things, a, a nicer house, a nicer car, better food. But Jesus says possessions do not determine quality of life. And he says because of that, and because that is such a popular philosophy, it is the way a lot of people live, his warning is to beware of that attitude. And again, he uses the word covetousness or greed. What is greed? I think most of us uh, understand the meaning of that word. A couple of definitions here. To always thirst for more. Doesn't matter how much you got or don't have. So that means that anybody can be greedy. If you have nothing, you can be greedy. If you have a lot, you can be greedy. If you're somewhere in between, you can be greedy because you thirst for more than you have. A uh, more official definition would be excessive and consuming desire to have more. There was a proverb from Jesus' day that was common among the Romans, and it said, money is like seawater. The more a man drinks, the thirstier he becomes. I think we can see that in the lives of people around us today, maybe even a little bit in ours, if we're not careful. But it's not just money that we can be greedy for. You can be greedy for a lot of things. You can be greedy for um, possessions, for popularity, for position, for power, for pleasure, for comfort. I mean, anything that we just want more and more and more and more of, never satisfied. So how do we apply this parable to our lives? We just go back to Jesus' statement. We can summarize it in three words. Guard against greed. Guard against greed. We need to look at our own lives. We could say, I'm not anything like the rich man. I'm not rich. <laughs> I don't have a great abundance. Even though that may be true, we may still be battling some of the thing, same uh, philosophy he had. We may be still working to get more and more and more and more. I want to be very quick to say that it's not wrong to want to earn a living. In fact, we're supposed to do that. It's nothing wrong for having a desire to want to improve your station in life, you know, to get a nicer house, nicer car. But is it a driving factor in your life? In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, in this parable, Jesus says, Take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So guard against greed. Now Jesus said, take care. Take care. This is a very strong statement. It's, it's more than just, oh, by the way, you ought to think about this. He says, take care. Okay, this is something you ought to pay attention to. This is something you should examine in your life and make sure you don't go the wrong direction with this. So how do we take care that we're not being motivated by greed or covetousness? And I would just say we need to change our focus. So let's take a look at what this man was focused on versus what we should be focused on. But we'll word it in such a way that it's a challenge to us, okay? So first of all, focus on God and others before yourself. You look at this story, you see that that's not what the rich man did. He was totally focused on himself. God and others are not even mentioned in the story and are not mentioned in his thoughts, in his words. In fact, the person he's talking to is himself. So if we want to guard against greed and covetousness and having the wrong attitude about possessions, we need to focus on God and others before ourselves. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't focus on ourselves. We need to take care of ourselves. But we don't need to be selfish. 
to use one of the words that we came up with to describe this man. Focus on God and others before yourself. It makes me think of Philippians 2, verses 3 to 5, where, it show, uh, where Paul is taking Jesus and describing him and his attitude as he came from heaven to save us and uses as an example for the type of attitude that we should have. And he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition and conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you also not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now notice, he did say here that we should look to other people, but he didn't say we should ignore ourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Can I tell you, I've discovered this to be true in my life, and I hope you've discovered it to be true in your life too, that there is much more satisfaction in living for and focusing on other people rather than ourselves. The second thing that we can use uh, to apply this to our lives, again, about changing our focus, focus on the eternal rather than the temporary. Going back to the story, what did the rich man do? He focused on the temporary. Now, we might say, well, he's looking ahead. He's storing all this up, so he's got plenty to live off of. He won't be dependent on others. He wants to live the rest of his life. But that's looking ahead only in the sense if we think of our life as all that there is. But when we realize that our life is such a short period of time compared to eternity, that focusing just on preparing for this life is very, very short-sighted. And that's what the rich man did. Instead, we're challenged. Focus on the eternal rather than the temporary. You know, in every area of life, not just money and possessions, think about what difference will this make 10,000 years from now, 100,000 years from now. We will still exist at that time. Our life may only be 70, 80, 90, or maybe a little bit more than that, years, but we will exist for eternity. How are our decision? How will uh, the way we invest our life and our money and our time and our energy and effort, how will that impact eternity, not just our retirement for our last couple of years? So focus on the eternal rather than the temporary. Jesus put it this way in verse 21. He says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In other words, we should seek to be rich toward God. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be rich toward toward God. It obviously doesn't mean being richer than God. Can't do that. Well, I think that what that means is that we will value what God values. We'll be more focused on what he thinks is important than what we might think is important. We will be more focused on what he wants us to do with our life and our possessions and our money and our time and our talents and abilities, all of which God has given to us. Next week, I think we'll look at another parable um, that'll examine this in more depth, talking about what God has given us and what are we doing with that. Uh, I came across this quote in the Life Application Commentary, and it says that to be rich toward God means that we will be using wealth that he provides to fulfill his priorities. People who are rich in this way love God and are filled with a passion to obey and serve him and to give to others. You know, eternal treasure is better than temporal treasure. But we spend so much time and energy focused on temporal treasure, the things of this world, the money and possessions that we can get. Matthew chapter six, verses 19 to 20, Jesus does some other teaching on this topic. And he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. You know, so many people live for today. And we can be drawn to that kind of a mindset too. Now we do need to live for today. But we don't need to live just for today. So many people just live for today. I like this quote. So many people just live for today. Others are wiser and plan for retirement. Now that's a whole nother issue. People that just live for today and when it comes time to retirement, they have nothing. Some people just live for today. Others are wiser and plan for retirement, but the wisest plan for the long term. In other words, they plan for eternity. And you know, that's something that we all have to wrestle with, and it's a never-ending uh, decision-making process. You know, we have to wrestle be with keeping a balance between providing for our needs now and enjoying life now here on earth and yet sending treasures ahead. In other words, using our resources, money, time, talents, all those things energy, 
using that to prepare for eternity and invest in eternity. Let's look at another focus. Uh, focus on God's purpose rather than possessions, power, and pleasure. Again, going back to the story, the rich man could care less about God's purpose. He was focused only on his possessions. Uh, he doesn't use the word power, but it's obvious he's a powerful man. And his pleasure, eat, drink, be merry, live the rest of your life in, in just wonderful enjoyment. But the challenge to us is to focus on God's purpose rather than possessions, power, and pleasure. When we go back to the title of the lesson, The Failure of Success. Let's talk about success a little bit. What does it mean to have success, to be successful? At its root, to be successful means to accomplish what you attempt. You can be successful in a lot of different ways. How are some ways that people define success? The one that just jumps out at me that I've heard most of my life is the one who, dies, the one who dies with the most toys wins. That, um, that just epitomizes that philosophy of get, 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 the things that I want, the things that I need, the things that are going to bring me pleasure, and the more I get, I win. <laughs> but to be honest with you, the truth of that statement is the one who dies with the most toys dies, and they don't take their toys with them. Now, is God against success? No. God wants us to be successful in so many areas of our life. He wants us to be uh, successful in our marriage. He wants us to be a successful husband, a successful wife, successful parent, grandparent. He wants us to be successful in our occupation. He wants us to be a successful student. He wants us to be successful in, in living a, a good, uh, wholesome, uh, abundant life. We're going to read that in just a moment. He wants an abundant life for us. But that doesn't need, that shouldn't be our primary focus. You see, God isn't against success, but his definition of it and his focus is different. So how might God's focus of success in life differ from others? Another quote from the Life Application Commentary. Success, talking about the type God would be um, behind, the way he would define it. Success is cooperating with God in establishing the kingdom of God in our hearts, all of our affairs, our personal relationships, and our society. Whatever else we do in life, however much we accumulate or acquire, unless we discover a personal relationship with Christ, seek to do His will in all of life, and test everything according to His purpose, we will not be successful. Can I tell you, seeking success outside of God's plan for our lives will bring false success, false satisfaction, and false security. Now when I say they're false, it doesn't mean they're not real. They're just temporary and they're not fully satisfying. The last comparison, the last focus. Focus on abundant life rather than abundant possessions. Again, going back to the story of the rich man, he was focused on his abundance of possessions. But Jesus says that's not what life is all about. So God challenges us to focus on abundant life rather than abundant possessions. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, and I referred to this earlier, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You know, there are many people who try to seek satisfaction apart from God, but they never find lasting satisfaction. So as we wrap this up, I just want to ask, do we have to be rich, you know, have an abundance of wealth to have these kind of problems? No. Poor people however you want to define rich and poor and where you fit, feel like you fit in that spectrum, they can have the exact same problem because the amount of money is not the issue. The issue is our attitude toward it and what we do with it. Going back to that main exhortation Jesus made, Luke chapter 12, verse 15, right in the middle of this passage, he says, take care. Be on your guard against covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Makes me think of the writer of Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9, when he says, Lord, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who's the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. I think the basic idea here is, God, give me what you know I need and help me to be content in my effort to live for you. So again, as we wrap this up, I want to ask you a question as I've got to ask myself, do you find yourself focused on the wrong things? Are you focused on yourself rather than on God and others? 
Are you focused on the temporary rather than the eternal? Are you focused on possessions, power, and pleasure rather than God's purpose? Are you focused on abundant possessions rather than abundant life? I'm going to be honest with you. As long as we live on this world, it's not going to be probably one or the other. I don't know that we could ever get to that place where we're 100% totally focused on God and His plans and His purposes and, and we're not at all focused on ourselves or on the temporary or on our possessions and, and our desire for all this other thing, you know, all these other things. I think it's a continual process of re-examining our life, re-surrendering to God, re-recognizing that God has given us all that we have. We should be thankful. We should use it to meet our needs because that's one of the main reasons he gave it to us, but it goes way beyond that. We should use it to help others and to establish his kingdom. That's what God is challenging me in this story to do. And I believe that if you have ears to hear, as Jesus often said, he'll be challenging you to do the same thing. Could you take a few minutes and just examine your heart, your life, your attitude toward toward um, your resources. Again, this is about money and possessions, but your time, your, your talents, and how you use them. What is your focus in life? Is it to live a good life for yourself? Or is it to follow Jesus, do his will, establish his kingdom, and help others while taking care of yourself and enjoying it as much as you can? God sure has blessed us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we've had together to look at your word. This story of the rich full. God, we could be blind to the fact that maybe we fit into that story a little bit. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings in our lives. And here in our country, in our culture, we, are, we have so much more than most of the people in the world, and we take it for granted. For whatever reason you've allowed us to experience that, Lord, we thank you for it. Help us, Lord God, not to be so self-focused, self-centered, selfish. God, I pray that you'd help us to really examine our hearts and to be sincerely honest about what we're doing with what you've given us. And God, may it not be all about just enjoying life. I thank you that we can enjoy life. You want us to enjoy life. But it's about using what you've given us to reach other people, to establish your kingdom, Lord God, to see your work done. And as we do that, we are investing our treasures in heaven and we will reap eternal rewards. Show us what that looks like in our lives. Show us how we know, need to go about doing that, Lord, with what you've given us. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Mm -hmm.